Hey guys, I just made a local two-player turn-based strategy game in Unity. The game plays out like a pre-deploy game in Advance Wars, where each player has a set amount of units and the player with the last remaining units win the game. If you're interested in making a similar type of game, I'll be covering the steps I took to complete the project as well as explaining how I did certain portions of the game. Please do bear in mind that the method that I use to complete each part of the game may not be optimal, but hopefully there's some merit behind how I implemented certain things. So without further ado, let's begin. The first thing that was created in the project was the map. The map is the most important part of the game, as it's where everything takes place. The basics of the map that I built was done by following Quill18 Creates' tutorial on how to implement grid-based movement, and I will essentially be summarizing the methods that he used to accomplish this task. The first thing that was created was completing a set of unique tiles to turn into a map. If you look in the background, you can see that the map is essentially built from a variety of tiles. The map was created by creating a 2D list of those tiles, and as you can see, each blue square is used to indicate a tile, which can be accessed by its index. For example, if I wanted the top left tile, I'd ask for the tile at 0, 0. The map, which is represented by our 2D list, is fine for what it does, but we need a bit more information to allow our pathfinding algorithm to easily calculate its path. The second thing that was done was implementing a graph. The graph created is essentially a node which has connections to its neighbors. So for example, in this graph, we have squares, which are the nodes, and each square has the knowledge of what's above it, to its right, below it, and to its left. And this allows us to calculate things a bit more easily. To allow a unit to move from point A to point B, the A star pathfinding algorithm was implemented. The algorithm takes a start point and an end point. From the start point, the distance between the two neighbors are calculated. In the diagram, from the start node to the node to its right, the cost will be 1. Following that, the node to the bottom of the start will cost 3. These two will be added to a list where the algorithm then removes the smallest number in the list, and the algorithm then repeats the process of checking the neighbors and adding the results to the list. This is repeated until the endpoint is located, or the endpoint could not be located, in the cases where you cannot reach the endpoint from the starting position. The graph being shown is a simplified version where it follows the shortest path to the endpoint and not the full algorithm. Each node remembers the preceding node that was used. When the algorithm has completed, if we trace back the nodes, we can build the path from the starting node. This gives us the shortest path from the start point to the endpoint. Again, this is a brief overview of the A-star pathfinding algorithm. I'll leave a link in the description for the Wikipedia page. Quilly can create this video series ends with the A-star implementation. With the foundation that we built in the previous section, we can begin by creating the necessary UI to communicate information to the player. In the background, I have gameplay from a game called Wargroove, and you can see that whenever I select a unit, the game clearly displays the available options for that unit, such as how far that unit can move and who's in its attack range. It also shows minor things such as the path that the unit will take to reach its destination. In this section, I'll be covering how I implemented these systems in my game. When the player selects a unit, we need to ensure that the game displays how far that unit can move. We can display the information by highlighting the tiles within reach, and we also need to determine which tiles are within reach of the selected unit. To implement this feature, I use a few hash sets that contain nodes. There are three hash sets, those being UI Highlight, Temp UI Highlight, and Final. You will also need a unit which has a specific movement speed or a movement range, and tiles that have a traversal cost. In this example, we will be using the map in our background. As you can see, the map is of size 5x5, and there's a unit in the middle of the map at location 2, 2. To the left of our unit is a mountain tile, which our unit does not have access to, and to its right and below it are forest tiles, which have a cost of 2. Every other tile in the map has a cost of 1, and our unit itself has a movement speed of 2. I'll also be using this 2D list of costs as a visual representation of what our code is currently doing. Please do keep in mind that our 2D list does not actually have the interconnections between the nodes, and it's simply there as a visual representation of what is happening. 
We first add the initial node to the final set. Then for each neighboring node, we add the cost of each node to our 2D list. When we have calculated the cost, we subtract the cost from our unit movement speed. And if the result is greater or equal to zero, then we'll add it into the UI set. Otherwise, we can ignore the cost if it's lesser than zero as our unit cannot make it to that position. We can now look at our 2D list of costs to get a good visual representation of what our code is doing. In the very first step, we have added the initial node, which is at 2, 2. And then for each of its neighbors, we will then check which ones our unit can move into. To the left is a mountain tile, which has a cost of infinity. So our unit movement speed minus infinity is negative infinity, which is less than zero. And therefore we will not be adding the mountain tile into our UI highlight. The next one is the forest to the bottom and to the right. These have cost two. So unit movement speed minus two is zero. And because it's still greater or equal to zero, then we'll be adding these two tiles into our set. The one above us has a cost of one. Two minus one is greater than zero and we'll be adding that tile to our set as well. After that initial setup, we will have three nodes in our UI set. We will then take those nodes and union them with our final set. In the previous section, we would check if the cost to get to a tile subtracted from our unit's movement speed is greater or equal to zero. If it is, then we'd add it. We are essentially going to be reusing this logic until there are no more available nodes from our starting position. There's a slight difference this time, where instead of adding to the UI set, we'll be adding to a temp UI set once the condition has been met. After each iteration is complete, all the information will be stored in the temp UI set. Afterwards, we will set our UI set to equal our temp UI set, and we will perform the same action of unioning the UI set to our final set. Afterwards, we will then reset our temp UI set. This process will essentially continue until the count of our UI set is zero. And this essentially means that there is no more additional movements that our unit can make. And afterwards, we are going to stop and then display the final set to our player. That was probably fairly difficult to follow. So I'm going to display every single step with the example of our 2D list of costs and hopefully this will make things a bit more easier to understand. After the initialization, we have three nodes in our UI set. For each of these nodes in our UI set, we are then going to look at their neighbors and then calculate if the cost that it took to get there subtracted from our unit's movement speed is greater or equal to zero. If it isn't, then we'll leave them out and we'll add the ones that do meet the condition. The only nodes that meet that condition are the nodes that have cost of two that are also highlighted in red. We will be adding these to our temp UI highlight and then unioning our UI set with our final set. Afterwards, we then reset our temp UI set. We then repeat the process until there are no more nodes in the UI set. After the iterations have completed, all of our nodes that the selected unit can reach have been added to our final set. We can then change the colors of the movable tiles to display that information to our player. For this next part, we need to display the total attackable options that our unit has from any given position and its total attack range as well. And to do this, we will first start with an example where our unit will have a movement speed of zero, so they can't move anywhere and they will only be occupying one node and they will also have an attack range of two. The reason why we're doing an example where the unit only has a movement speed of zero is because it's a lot easier to visualize how the code is functioning. And when we need to translate this into multiple nodes, all we need to do is repeat the same code for each node in the unit's movement options. Here's the code that I used to essentially show the attackable tiles. We'll also be having a, a display to essentially visualize what's happening at each step of the code. We first begin by adding node n, which is the only tile that our unit can move to. Then for each node in neighbor hash, we will find its neighbors and then add them. Once they have been set to temp neighbor hash, we will then 
set neighbor hash to temp neighbor hash and reset temp neighbor hash. We then just repeat the process and check every single node that is currently in our neighbor hash set and perform the same actions and adding them into a temporary hash set. Then we do the same thing as the previous portion where we set our neighbor hash to our temp neighbor hash and then reset our temp neighbor hash. It might look fairly strange because the code that we just did is not represented in the game in our background right now and our map and our current unit is over a red tile but it is set to blue because the unit can move there and that's because I left out a fairly important part of the code which essentially removes all the in-between that should not exist. We'll leave the code right now and leave the additional parts in bold so it's easier to see. Essentially all it does is that whenever it is not on the unit's actual attack range, so when we're building up to let's say attack range of 2, all we do is we add the nodes that we have seen throughout the process and then afterwards once the loop has finished we just subtract the two sets and we'll have the remaining outer perimeter which we can actually reach. This time I'll show you with a unit of attack range 3 and a movement speed of 0. This is without the code that eliminates the in-between that we've used before. So if we were to click the unit right now, you can see that an attack with a range of 3 should only be able to go 1, 2, 3 outwards, and it should not be able to attack the tiles that are right beside of it. And let's cancel out for now. Now in the case that we have actually implemented that code in, I just uncommented it in my program. When we click the unit right now, we should see that all the in-between that was there before is now removed, and the only actual real attackable tiles are displayed on our screen right now. So you can see that that's fairly important to ensure that the correct information is displayed to the player. Now we will be tackling the final part of our UI display, and that is the arrow that essentially shows the player what path the unit will take to get to the selected destination. As you can see in our game right now, if I were to select the unit, we have a few movable options and then when we mouse over to them, an arrow appears to display to our user which path that the unit will take. And this is very simple to program. If you remember at the beginning when we implemented the A star pathfinding algorithm, we had a path from the start point to our end point. And essentially what we will be doing is we'll be reusing that code and checking each single node and its relationship to the next node. For this example, let's just say that our path is from our current position just up. So 2, 2 to 2, 3 to 2, 4. You can see in the display that it's actually very simple. You actually just count the path from, let's say, the middle one, which is 2, 3. Where are we coming from? We're coming from 2, 2. So 2, 3 minus 2, 2 normalized is 0, 1. And 0, 1 translates to a vector dot up. So we know that from our previous node to our current node, we are going up. And then we have to do the next step, which is to calculate our current node to the next node. So we'll be doing 2.4 minus 2.3 dot normalized. And then that also gives us 0, 0.1. And we know that that's up as well. So from our middle position, we know that to get there, we have to go up. And then to get to the next one, we have to go up. So both of them are up. So we'll just be displaying a straight line. And then on the next one, which is 2, 4 and 2, 3, which is our last one, we essentially just need to show which way the arrow is showing. So all we have to do is essentially just calculate the one previously. So we'll be doing 2, 4 minus 2, 3 dot normalized. And we can see that that's up as well. So on that one, we'll just be displaying an arrow facing upwards. In the case that, let's say in the middle, we moved right. So instead of going to 2, 4, let's just say we went to 3, 3 and went to the right instead. We would just do the math and instead of it being 0, 1, we'd probably have 1, 0 and that would be a right turn for us. And then we know that we go up and then right. We'll just have an arrow that comes from up and then goes to right. If you're wondering how I implemented the UI movement as well as the UI cursor, it's actually very easy. All there is is three different layers of UI quads that are invisible until they're required. Once the unit is selected, then the tiles become visible and I change their colors and their rotation depending on whatever I need. And how they're set up is very simple as well. They're just all on very minor different Y levels. So the movement display is on the lowest level followed by the cursor with the arrow, and then the very top level has the cursor itself. Now I'm going to talk about the miscellaneous things I did during development. 
and I won't be going into too much detail about these things, but I'll just briefly cover all the things that I did and how to go about doing those things. For all the art, I essentially just used GIMP and made a 32 by 32 canvas, and I just went at it and tried to make whatever I could that would stick. And the final thing I ended up with is the skeleton soldier. Making different sprites for each animation was fairly time consuming, but once I got everything running, the Unity animator was really easy to use, and I just strung together a few animations with a few different sprites. If we take a look at the level, we can see that the majority of the level is actually created with Unity's terrain systems. Unity's terrain system is actually fairly easy to use. Once you create a terrain object, you can then just paint over it with your mouse. You can raise and lower terrain, and you can paint textures onto the terrain to give it a lot more detail. You can see that the mountains are painted over with a rock material and the other sections such as the grass and the dirt have a different texture altogether. The trees as well as the grass are also part of the terrain system. All you need to do is just create a tree with the Unity engine by right clicking and you can create a 3D object and you can create a tree. And the grass is essentially just a sprite that was used by the terrain system to create grass. The next thing in the scene is essentially these rocks. And these rocks are fairly detailed and I did not make them myself. You can find these on the asset store under the rocks and boulders 2 package. Next thing I want to cover is the camera. The camera is the RTS camera from the asset store. And I made a few modifications to it so whenever you scroll down to a certain threshold, the camera will linearly interpolate and rotate its position. and that allows it to translate a bit more smoothly from the different orientations that it's placed into. Also, when the unit attacks, I added a camera shake to essentially give the game a bit more feel. So when you attack something, it doesn't feel as weak and there's actually some response when you click. For the sound effects of the game, all I did was record things in Audacity and change the pitch up and down, change the speed and things like that to get a desired sound. And for the music itself, I purchased a Humble Bundle, which had a wide variety of music, and I just used that for the background music. Adding sound just livens up your game and gives the player a bit more feedback whenever they perform an action. I also made a section that teaches people how to play the game, and it gives them rules on how things work out. This is important to always include just because not everyone knows how to play your game. You might have obscure controls, or they might not just be used to what you expect the controls to be, or they're just new to the genre of game itself. So it doesn't hurt to add a how to play the game section. All right, I think that concludes our video series of, I guess, the development of this game. Hopefully, if you want to build a game of similar nature, I've given you enough tools to essentially start building whatever you need on your own. And otherwise, if you don't plan on building anything, and I really hope the watch was at least a bit entertaining, or at least gave you a bit of insight about how I tackled a few things and how things are done. The way I tackle things is probably not the most optimal way, but I think it worked out all right. And there was a lot of bugs here and there, and essentially that was a lot of the time that I spent for development was just after I added the animations, some new bugs appeared, I had to get rid of those. After I added another system, a few new bugs came up, and I had to go deal with that. So throughout this entire process, I think the most time consuming parts aside from the programming was the animations, the sprite creations, the map design, everything else that essentially wasn't the coding. The music and the sound effects weren't that bad, but by far the longest part was probably the creation of this video. And it's just because I had to make a lot of graphs, had to edit a lot of things. So yeah, if you found this helpful, I don't know, leave a like, I guess. and. Yeah, thanks for watching.